If you could just go into a little bit Hi, of Marty. the Sorry. HFE process, the creative process for dreaming up something like this. Well, our, our general process, we always start out with big picture, how are we going to allocate capital between all of our parks? We have 26 properties, only about 15 of them take capital. So it always starts out with where do we need to put the capital to drive the best return, best attendance. And in this case, Silver Dollar City's year was, was coming up. And we just knew, first of all, the, the obvious miss of this park was no wooden coaster that was really substantial. And we've always been a great park for the empty nesters, second honeymooners. We have great shows, great entertainment. We have great food, great retail. But we lagged on, on high performance rides and we want to be just as good of an experience for a teenager as, as a, an empty nester here. So we knew we had a gap and we wanted to fill it. So that's how the process started. Awesome. And how does Outlaw Run fit so even in? Even when he's asking questions, I should look at you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's Sorry really hard for, the for confusion. me. It's just human nature. How does Outlaw Run fit into HFE's vision? Well, Outlaw Run fits into our vision because at a, from a big picture standpoint, what we're all about is creating memories worth repeating. That's the what we do every day. Why we do it is to bring families closer together. So everything we do, we think through how are we going to be satisfying a multi-generational family that wants to come here as a family and enjoy the hopefully the best day of their year. And to get that art designed correctly. We have to have something for everybody. And we had that gap we felt we needed to fill and Outlaw Run filled it in a variety of ways. But big picture, that's what we're trying to accomplish. In terms of investing $10 million, that's, I'm sure a lot of people would consider that a huge risk. How high were the stakes for something like this and what was the risk involved here? Yep. This was a very risky investment for us. It's the, this technology has never been used on an all new ride. It had been used on some redos in the industry, but uh, one of the most gratifying things today of being here is that I remember three years ago where we sat in that room and we said, are we going to take the kind of risk to do all new technology, never been done before at our kind of smaller company? And the fact that we did it and it's worked out really well, I can tell it's going to because it's a dynamic ride. I, don't, I know the turnstiles are going to turn. It's a very, very gratifying day because it's a big rest for us. And the fact that Hirsch Entertainment really has done two groundbreaking rides in a row. Last year at uh, Dollywood, we did Wild Eagle, which is the first winged coaster installed in the United States. And now we're doing the first double barrel roll, the steepest drop on a wooden coaster. I'm very excited about it. Uh, we don't have to be an innovation leader um, to, to do really well, but it's really gratifying when we are. How do you know that Outlaw runs a success? Uh, um, I, well, I will know Outlaw runs a success based on the turnstiles. Uh, we're, you know, we put $10 million in. Our, our bogeys, we like to get about a 20% return on our, on our investment, so we're hoping to get $2 million in incremental EBITDA on whatever we did last year to pay for it. And I, th I think we'll do that. Um, you know, I can tell already just by writing it in the response. Uh, you can tell. The, the enthusiasts are screaming when they get off it. They're not quiet. It grips you from the moment you get on. Um, I think the metrics will take care of themselves. But even if they didn't, I still think we've done the right thing for the park because we've taken the park to a different level, but I'm, I'm sure they're gonna pay off. Now you mentioned your experience on it. Would you mind going into a little detail on that first experience actually getting to ride this ride after all the years of planning? It is, it's a very surreal feeling because uh, it, and it never gets old. You, you All the planning that goes into it, and all the review meetings and all the decisions you had to make along the way and the cost cuts in some areas and, and adding money in others. There's just a lot that goes into it. So when you get here and you're sitting in that car, there's so much anticipation, but you go up and it's clicking. And even though I knew what was gonna come because I had seen it, I've seen it designed, I've seen the camera on the cars when they were just water dummies. 
there's nothing like going down that first time and it, it's an uh, incredible thrill and it really does grip you. You go down that 81 degree drop and the most uh, amazing thing about the ride to me is the middle, which I wasn't sure how great it was going to be, is even better than I expected. When you do the 153 degree turn out and then you come right back. Uh, I actually thought that was even more thrilling than the double barrel roll at the end. Maybe because I knew the double barrel roll was coming, um, but it's just an incredible ride. How does the Outlaw Run transform the wooden roller coaster as we know it? How is it a game changer? It, it's a game changer from a technology standpoint because the engineering specs and the standards are so tight. The tolerances are tight. Uh, the way it's prefabbed in the factory in the six layers of wood and w on the side beams of the of the track are cut in the factory and then as, as opposed to being bent which is the case in a lot of the metal coasters so the the metal is uh, has less tolerance for movement and it's, it's pre-engineered so it's very tight to the wheel and then they fill it with concrete once it's installed here. So uh, I'm sure Fred can tell you more detail about that, but the result for me is a, uh, at my knowledge level, it's a very tight ride. It's incredibly smooth. You're going at a high rate of speed that usually, even a, a new wooden coaster, you'd be shaking a lot more than you're shaking. So it's very tight, very smooth. And then over time, the maintenance cost will be lower because the tolerances are tighter and it won't, it won't shake and rattle so much over time. So. I'm excited for Fred and his company. He's a great human being. Uh, you know, part of investing in innovation is the partner you're working with. And we trusted Fred, uh, believed what he said, and he, he did say what he was, he said what he was going to do, and he did it. And so we're very proud of him. I want to ask you about that for a second. Uh huh. How um, we were listening to your book on the way over here and how your values actually are a big part. They determine your action. Values how does that play in when you choose a partner like this to work with? Um, how does how is that involved in the decision making process? Or is that is that just a business decision, or is that a values decision as well? It's a, it's a great question. Uh, the values we have as a company play a role, definitely play a role in who we work with as a supplier. You know, every time we've gone away from that and just done it based on strictly the numbers, even when our gut told us there weren't as good of people. We've usually regretted that decision. Now, we're not gonna greatly overpay if, if you know, just because they're quote unquote uh, fit our values better, but it's an important part of the decision making factor, decision making in the whole process, because it's not just a one time investment. You know, when things go wrong, you gotta call them, they gotta come back. Are they people of integrity who are gonna do what they say they're gonna do and follow up and you know, we've been burned just like every other business and you just find over time the integrity of the leader of the company you're working with is much more important than whether they're three percent different than the next closest vendor um, so it's very important it's a good question how does this ride carry on the legacy that the Hershens founded here back in 1960 for silver dollar city we always hope to carry on the legacy that Jack and Pete put into place. It's, it's a huge challenge and probably the thing that intimidates me the most as the leader. Jack and Pete have done such a great job building a very unique property and we don't want to hurt that uniqueness. In the same regard, uh, the park was so good for empty nesters and second honeymooners, we really need to expand its appeal to the teenager and the young child. And so when we do those, we do them in a way that's heavily themed, but also back parts of the park so we don't destroy the integrity and the feel of the central Silver Dollar City Village. And from that way, I think we've enhanced what they started here and we haven't taken away from it. What sold you on this being the perfect ride for this park? When the idea was pitched to you, you said in that meeting three years ago, what was it specifically about it that just well, said, this is, this is it, this is, this is what we need to do? Well, we were looking at a lot of different options. It wasn't just uh, Rocky Mountain coasters. For me, it was the world first. I mean, not to be too obvious, but to be the first wooden coaster to ever do a double barrel roll, the steepest drop in the world, 
and since the you know the, they closed down uh, uh, Son of Beast at Kings Island, we will be the only coaster going upside down. That's uh, that's an amazing marketing hook that you don't get very often, and the fact that we could be first and market that first is incredible. And uh, I'm just so thankful we were able to do it two years in a row with Wild Eagle and then Outlaw Run. But that was the biggest reason. And obviously, as I said earlier, we didn't have a great wooden coaster here, and this park, it just cries for one, I think. We weren't going to bring up Son of Beast unless you mentioned it, but does, does that play into just feeling a little apprehensive at trying a concept like this when something so similar has failed so drastically? Yeah, of course, uh, that's part of the risk factor, but the, the engineering of this ride is very different than Son of Beast. And I actually think, you know, the, the, I'm not an engineer, but I think the barrel rolls are also a better way to go about. It's a tighter loop. Um, much less chance of things to go wrong and if tolerances change a little bit things getting stuck and I think when they did a bigger loop in Son of Beast that was probably the problem uh, Fred Fred would speak to that better than I would but you know there's always risk in business and uh, you know it's on me if, if the risk doesn't work it's not on the great team to put this together because they, they I think they did a great job and I'm very confident we can solve any issues that we confront with this one uh, what else should we talk about that we haven't? Fred will be, be able to hit the technology piece, engineering. the engineering. We just mostly wanted to talk to you the more big about picture. the big picture, the vision picture. and mission, and how this fits which in we with hit. It, which we did. Um, you know, the only thing we didn't talk about is storyline. Yes. And you know, one interesting topic know is is why we chose Outlaw Run, okay. and also just issues we had some issues with um you know should we put a gun in the logo yeah. and all that kind of stuff so i'm happy to talk <laughs> about the marketing was, aspect yeah. so and even where we place that, yeah. it in the park was real specific so if you want me to go there sure, a little if bit. you could speak to that i know brad mentioned before kind of the theme of the good guys winning right, I and i'd there. i'd love for you to address that too from the bigger picture standpoint yeah. than silver dollar city more hfe yeah okay well there were a couple of interesting marketing issues with this ride. Silver Dollar City is part of Hirshner Entertainment. We're always about wholesome family entertainment. We will never do anything to violate a mother's trust in what we offer. So we always err on the side of being conservative. Um, calling something Outlaw Run, we didn't want to glorify outlaws. So we were very careful in that the good guys always win in this. The, the law enforcement's more glorified than the outlaw. And we also had to choose, our original logo had the outlaw had guns, and we decided to, to can the guns, keep the horse riding fast. Just with all the gun issues out there today, we didn't need that kind of uh, negative press around it. So those were all thoughtful decisions. Another really thoughtful decision is where to place the ride. Um, it helped the storyline of outlaws chasing the, the good people and so we wanted out of town, but that allowed us, to, again, to get it away from Center City so the noise and the height of the ride wouldn't overpower that more gentler center of Silver Dollar City. So um, a lot of interesting issues to deal with as we work through the design process. One question, a little off topic, I'm sure you get asked this a lot. How has being on Undercover Boss kind of changed your role? Now, obviously, people recognize you everywhere you go. I'm sure you got stopped so many times just in that one stretch on the way here. How has that changed daily life for you? I want to wait till the train goes up. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> The Undercover Boss experience was a fantastic experience. Personally, it changed my life a little bit because I, I was more recognized for whatever that's, you know, that's not necessarily a good thing. I'm an introvert, so I don't necessarily love that. But what the great thing about it is it inspired me because of the outcry of positives about our culture. It caused me to write the book. And the book has taken what Jack and Pete have taught me here about how to lead in a caring fashion, lead with love, and allowed me to help teach others to do it. Because coming from the auto industry, I had never been shown that. And I think it's a great way to lead. And I think other leaders, really people who care, want to lead that way. 
and they want to they want permission to know it's okay to lead that way and they can, you can still lead a financially successful enterprise doing that so from a big picture standpoint undercover boss has been uh, a real blessing and i'm really really glad i made the decision to do it excellent and then for the aspiring ceo like the the albert that that we saw <laughs> in undercover boss the albert type who wants to get into that role one day what what would what advice would you tell that type of person because i know there's a plenty of them on on daniel's website or who just because I'm, you know, I was going to address that with you in a second, but maybe So what if you want to be a CEO of a, a entertainment I'm company? From, well, no, I'm growing from okay. one website to a family of websites that covers right. not just coasters, but theme parks in general, water parks, haunts, and anything and everything in the theme park industry. And it's, it's becoming a more like a CEO than a president, than just right. a president or something Then the like operating that. decisions, yeah. Um, well, my advice on being a CEO is, first of all, be passionate about what you're doing because you can only do great work when you're passionate, but you, know, you clearly are passionate about what you do. Uh, but a lot of people aspire to certain roles and they're either not built for it or they're not wired for it or they're not passionate about it. And so I would kind of be careful what you wish for, make sure you're wired for it. Everybody's not a leader. Um, they say it's lonely at the top. It really is because all the tough decisions are coming to you. There's no one else to go to. And it takes a unique type of leadership to battle through all that. Um, and the other thing, the other advice I give is the, the quote unquote higher you get up, the more you have to trust people, the less you can micromanage. You have to let them make mistakes and choose when to get involved. And the choice I make is I always just ask the question, what's the worst case scenario here and can I live with it or not? And if I can't, it's catastrophic to the company or the product, I'll, I'll inject myself if I think it's headed in the wrong direction. If I can live with it and the, the error is not going to cost us that much, I let it go because people have to learn to make mistakes. They do things in different ways. And I think the, as a CEO, you have to learn to choose your spots of when you get engaged and when you don't. My, I, just throw this I know I'm not the one being interviewed. My big question always when people come to me is, how does this how does this accomplish our mission or vision and yeah. that's the first question i ask them and it's like why do you always ask me that and it's like because that is the important thing our values and our vision are the important that's thing. a great that's great i see i've learned from you i don't ask that enough probably but that's a great thing to do because what well it's a good idea if it doesn't if it's just adding it on over here to the side just to make us bigger and it doesn't accomplish what we set out that's to our very goals, good that's very that's, good and that, that's kind of what we wanted to ask you how does this accomplish your goals that you yeah. set out well that's as i said this question. definitely this definitely helps us bring families closer together and uh, creates a memory worth repeating in the end of the day and that's a very good point you make because a lot of our decisions sometimes are, are now becoming, since we've been around for so long, what do we take away? Mm -hmm. Because you can't just keep adding because right. of the costs. And so we have, to, we have to use an eraser too. And choosing what to take away to keep the balance with the family right, those are important decisions too. Because as you know, choosing what to do and not to do, those are the toughest questions. There's a lot of ideas, idea, yeah, a lot of ideas out there. Um, but that's a that's a great. I've learned from you on that. That's a great question to ask. I've I've really looked forward to meeting you on this trip and um, wrap up here. But just it was a few years ago that Devin and I just decided, no matter what, you know, the money is not the important. The money will come if we make yeah. the right decisions and lead correctly. We're we're both Christians, and we decided we are Christians first. That's really how, encouraging. This is how, you know, we respond. We we do everything we do to bring honor and glory to God, and that is number one for every administrative decision that we make. Is this honoring to God? Yes or no? And that's sort of an unwritten vision thing. And then number two is 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 this family friendly? You know, does this promote a family friendly environment that encourages discussion about right. so and so and so? And so? If not, we have no business doing it because that's what we told our community, that that's what our community is here. Well, that's for, interesting so. you mentioned that. And I wasn't sure you know, if I should go there as we're talking, but 
we, we have three shareholder objectives, even bigger picture than I, with, from our mission and our vision. Right. Uh, the three, share, three, three shareholder objectives are, we want to be a great place to work for great people. So you got to be a great person for it right. to be a great place. We want to have Christ at the center of what we do and we want a good financial return. Well, that second one, Christ at the center of everything we do, I couldn't take that to 26 properties like Philadelphia and San Francisco. I had to figure out a different way to communicate it because not everybody is a Christian. And right. We aren't a Christian company. We're a, a company founded and operated in Christian principles. So that's why we took the seven words of love and, and made that our leadership philosophy. That's how we reflected the teachings of Jesus because his number one commandment was love God and love others. He said, you boil it all down. That's the one commandment. Well, how are we going to be pleasing to him? We're going to be pleasing by loving God and loving others. And so that's why it's the basis to our whole philosophy. So when you ask, is it important? It's really important, especially important with how we treat our customers and how we treat our employees so that they'll treat the customer the right way. You will not be a, a senior leader in this company if you don't do both hit your financial targets and hit what we call our do goals mm -hmm. and hit your be goals, which is what kind of person do I want to be? And that's a person that is loving. Now, we don't, we don't require you to believe a certain way, but if you don't behave that way, you won't be working here. And it's the same way for us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're, we're a lot smaller, but it's the same way for us. We had those issues and we just there are people that refuse to be at what we said we were going right. to be and doesn't matter say, what size you are say, i don't care how talented you are or how smart you are if you refuse to reflect the value yeah if you're arrogant of this, or of, and you don't treat our customers right and they complain about that then that's you know good for that's you that's not what we want and so yeah size doesn't matter you could, if you have two or more people you will start having those issues yes. just because we have 10,000 it just means a lot more issues. It's just really encouraging to hear somebody, like you said, when you were at Liberty, it's just really encouraging to have somebody say, you have permission to talk about this. You can come right. out and you can say talk this. Talk about how you treat other people. Right, and, and how that is what makes us, I feel, distinctively different. And it's what makes you distinctively different and makes your company distinctively different. Yep. Is that there are lots of other people that do the same thing, but they don't do it in the same way right. that... And isn't it funny, as a result, when you go to the parks, they feel differently. And, oh, yes. and sometimes you can't explain why. But, you know, I, get, I, could, I have tons of letters, dozens of letters from customers who say, you know, we're the friendliest park they've ever been to, including Disney. And I love Disney. And they're a right. great company. And no one does it better all in all. But to get those kind of compliments that we're at the par of them when we spend a fraction of what they spend just says the quality of our people, you know, not our attractions. The customer can tell. Sometimes they're like, I feel like I'm just being pushed through because they want to meet their their quotas on ride count or they want me to just, they just want my money or, you know, sometimes they just say that it's the rudest people there and they don't act like they want to be there. And I've never heard that about anyone from any of your parks. I just well, want to let you know that. I've been I appreciate that. We certainly certain make before. mistakes and yeah. you, know, you get a hot, 25,000 person day here and we, we make mistakes but right. hopefully they're few and far between. I mean our friendliest scores we track it at every park and we have some parks at 99 percent top box friendly meaning that the customers are giving us four out of four on friendliness which of course supports the you know kindness is one of our words exactly. of love and that's friendliness and encouragement so it's, it's pretty amazing, and it, does, it happens with a lot of good leadership, starting with Jack and Pete from all those years ago.